Um, and before I go into the sermon, I want to let you guys know that I thoroughly love my job. I don't know about your job. I don't know um, if you love your job or if you hate your job. I've worked, I've worked at places where I thought, if I could get fired, this would be a really good day. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, because I, I didn't like those jobs. You might thoroughly hate your job, uh, but I want to give you some good I like mine. <laughs> So you can be happy for me. I really, really love my job. I love to study the Word of God. I love to share the Word of God uh, with people. I love the Christian fellowship that I have within our church. I love the Christian fellowship that I have outside of our church, you know, with people that go to other churches and stuff. I love having Christian fellowship. But there is the other side of my job that's not as glamorous. Um, everybody's got those, those, the other side of their job. Um, I've got the other side of my job too that's not so glamorous. But I want to know, you to know that I love that as much. I get to carry the burdens of other people. And when I carry the burdens of other people, I don't mean I just get to listen to what their burdens are. I do carry those. I, I am praying for you. My heart goes out to you. I, am, I, I carry those with you. Um, and, I, and I love that. I, I have to make personal sacrifices on a regular basis doing my job. I get to do the funerals of my friends. That's one thing I get to do. That's part of my job. I get those midnight calls where people just need a friend to talk to at 2 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the morning. That's my job. And I want you to know, I love my job. As the pastor of this church, I love my job. What about the funerals? I love that part too. I don't like the goodbyes, but I love pouring myself into the life of other people. And that's a way I get to do that too. So I want you to know that I thoroughly love my job. There are displays of hurt and brokenness that come through our doors all the time. Not just Sundays and Wednesdays, but throughout the week, there are people that walk through our doors that are carrying huge burdens and they're broken people. And I love spending time with them. I thoroughly love my job. The other day I was asked, how do you do it? How do you do it? And to this morning, I want to give you the only answer I know, because I don't. Um, I, I want to explain that, but it's, there's no credit that goes to me. How do you do it? How do you make it through these times? How do you do all the things you do? I really can't say I do. Um, I've got a lot of huge to me, ministry that we have here. She Incredible help, but it's even farther than that. You know, we, we get a lot of help. This sermon isn't about how I'm able to move forward through the difficult times, but how we are all able to move forward in the difficult times. And yes, it is something that I'm applying to my life, and you know, it works. I, I've taken this lesson and I've applied it to my life, and I know it works, and that's why I want to share it with you. Because we all struggle. We all have hard times. We all, you might be going through them right now. Well, this is a good day to be in church. You know, oh, I get the answer to how to get through that difficult time. Yeah, today. And it's free. We're not charging a thing for it. You, you, get, you get everything for the price of nothing. You just come, you just sit there. I will do all the talking. You just stand there and stare at me. That's not a hard job. You get to do it. It's that easy. And I want to share this with you. God has offered me the grace to do my job. But I want you to know where I found that grace. I want you to know this. I love my job. I love my life. I love the, st I'm thankful for the struggles that I've had in my life because of the things I've learned through those struggles. And I look forward to whatever God has in store for me, whether it's good times or bad times, I'm, I'm looking forward to whatever God can teach me how I can grow and learn in the future. I've learned a lot of things in this life that God has given me. And I'm still young. I look old, but I'm still young. Um, and I've got a long way to go, I hope. Uh, but I'm learning as I go every single day, I'm learning something new. Never lose the ability to learn. The day you think you have arrived, you've lost it all. If you think you are all knowing, like, oh man, I think I figured out every lesson there is to life, there's one big one you need to learn. You don't know it all, and you need to be teachable. Always be teachable and grow. So I want to introduce you to the man who taught me 
so many of those life lessons. If you want to learn about a topic, it's a good idea to go to an expert on that topic. You should go to somebody who knows what they're talking about in that area. So I went to a man named Job. Anybody ever heard of Job? The book of Job in the Bible is a fascinating book, and I do challenge you to read it. It's like it's 42 chapters long. It's a the lengthier book, but the story is incredible. So I do challenge you to read that book. Job was a man who seemed to have a good grasp on what life was all about. Look at how God introduces Job. Job chapter 1 in verse 1. This is, this is how God opens up the book. Job chapter 1 in verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. The first verse of this book told me that this guy might just have it going on. Just that first verse right there. Like, you know what? This guy might have it figured out. There wasn't any wrongdoing that you could find evidence to accuse him of. It says he was blameless. You couldn't come up, you can accuse him of whatever you want, but you couldn't find the evidence to, that could stand against him. He was blameless. He walked according to what was right and what was godly. He was in complete awe of God and he respected God. And he wanted nothing to do with evil. That's what that verse just said. That's who this guy was. This was a man that I wanted as a role model in my life. If you read the book of Job, you're like, man, how did he do it? How did he do it? This was a person that we should all desire to be like. Job, Job is a really good role model. He had a wisdom and an understanding that I wanted. I remember sitting down. I remember the first time I read the book of Job. Like, oh, wow. That's rough. That's a rough life right there. Job isn't the guy. You're standing in line saying, I want to, I want to turn. I want to, I want to do that now. Job's, Job's life was really, really rough. But he had a wisdom and an understanding that I wanted. So I began to search for where he got that wisdom and where he got that understanding. God had a good relationship with Job and God blessed Job in that relationship. God continues to describe Job in verse two. Look at Job chapter one and verse two. It says, and seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household. So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. Job had a good life and he was blessed. Of course he did everything God wanted him to do. God kept blessing, right? I mean, he keeps blessing you. Are you going to want to do everything that God wants you to do? I mean, he keeps just pouring out. I mean, he was a wealthy, wealthy man. God kept blessing him. Of course, he would just do whatever what God wanted him to do. That's exactly the argument that Satan presents God with. How can Job be a great role model to anyone if he can only model a comfortable life? That's the, that was the question. Satan says, of course he's doing good. Look at him. You've blessed him so much. Of course he's going to serve you. Of course he's going to follow you. He can, but he can only model a comfortable life. Most of us don't get to live a life of ease at all times. I know I don't get to do that. We don't get to live a life of ease all the time. So if Job can only model a comfortable life, then he's not exactly a role model. This was the argument that Satan throws at God. Anyone can do what they're asked to do if they feel the pay is good enough. So yeah, look at him. So Satan makes an offer to God. Look at the offer, verse 9 of chapter 1. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now... Stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. Satan's argument was that Job was only staying faithful to God. God was staying faithful to Job. Start, start messing with what he has. Start taking away what he has, and he will curse you to your face. The only reason he's staying faithful to you is because you've been faithful to him. That was Satan's argument. People often feel like God has abandoned them when bad times come. We've all been there. It's like, whew. 
yeah, I feel like maybe God just turned his back on me. Maybe he's punishing me. Maybe he's abandoned me. They think that God has done them wrong, so they typically become angry and want nothing to do with God. This is what Satan is banking on with Job. Take away everything he has, and he'll crush you to your face. I'm banking on it. He said, if you take away all that he has, he's going to turn his back on you, God. I, I'm sure of it. So go ahead. Cause him harm. Bring bad times to Job, and you'll see that this relationship isn't what you think this relationship is. Now, before we go on, I want to make a statement that's extremely important to understand. God has nothing to prove here, and Job has done nothing wrong. The book of, read through the book of Job. Job loses so much. God makes the deal. Isn't that one? That that's our God. <laughs> the Satan says, okay, you hurt him. Take away everything he has and see if he won't be fa faithful to you. See if he, he'll turn his back on you. Go ahead, do it. And God says, all right, let's do it. Now, I want you to know that God has nothing to prove here. Nothing to prove. He could have said, Satan, go away. I'm right, you're wrong. It'll always be that way. Bye-bye. Yeah, he could have just had that conversation. But he did not do that. Job also hasn't done a thing wrong here. He doesn't deserve this. God doesn't need to make a deal with Satan in order to protect his own reputation here. Satan is trying to bait God. I'm trying to bait you. And even though God allows the tough times to come in Job's life, God is not taking the bait. We've got to understand that. God is not falling for anything. He's not taking the bait. God is in control the entire time. Satan's not winning here. Now, Job does learn a lot through the things that he goes through. He learns so much. There's so many lessons in the book of Job. You watch what he learns. Watch how he grows. He learns so much through the hardships, but there's something more going on here. Many times, we, we often say Jesus is a good example, right? Everybody would agree Jesus is a pretty good example to follow. Yeah, he, he lived a good, righteous, holy life. But a lot of times we say the reason he did that is because he was 100% God. Of course he could live a perfect life because he was a perfect God. 100% man, 100% God. But of course he was going to do it right because he's God. It was about a man who did the same thing. He was not God. What do you do with this guy? What do, you, what do you do with Job? This is how Job caught my attention. Because I can't even say, well, Job was God. Of course he did a good job. No, he did a good job, and he is not God. So Job grabbed my attention with that thought right there. There are so many lessons we can learn from this book, but I want to show you a few that really impacted my life. God does allow calamity to come to Job. He does allow the bad times to come. He lost his animals. He lost his buildings. He lost his children. He lost his health. His friends accused him of sinning against God. Otherwise, why would God be allowing this to happen? You must have sinned against God. So they're constantly telling Job, oh, you should repent. And Job's like, I did not do anything wrong. Now you're denying it. You, you must have done something wrong or otherwise God would not have allowed this to happen. So even Job's friends are not really supportive. <laughs> They're like, yeah, he's mad at you. He's really mad at you. Otherwise, this wouldn't have happened. Look at Job's response to all of these events. Job chapter 1 and verse 22. It says, in all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. When I saw this verse, I started to desire his secret. How do you do it? You lost your land. You lost your buildings, all the buildings, the storehouses, everything you had. Your 10 children died in one day. All 10 of his children die in one day. His servants are killed. His friends are telling him, hey, you must have done something wrong. You're in the wrong, Job. And in all of this, it says he did not charge God with wrong at all. I want to know the secret. That's what I wanted to know. What's your secret? How do you do it? What makes a person stay faithful in a life that is constantly falling apart? 
uh, hopefully you're intrigued by this man because I was thoroughly intrigued by him. I mean, his life has fallen apart like none of our lives have ever fallen apart. God went ahead and said, all right, let's go ahead and push it all the way forward and let's see what happens. But God knew the heart of Job. God knew Job's secret. I wanted to learn from this guy because he was apparently an expert in the field of suffering righteously. So I wanted, I wanted to know, how do you do that? What's your secret there? But the irony of one of the key things that I learned about Job was found in what Satan said, not necessarily in what Job did. One thing that Satan says just blows my mind here. Satan makes a very valid argument in chapter two. At this point, Job has lost his land, he's lost his possessions, he's lost his children but he's still remaining faithful to God. So Satan ups the game a little bit here, and he makes a very accurate statement. Look at Job 2 and verse 4. So Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. Satan says, bring physical suffering and the thought of death to Job's face and see if he won't curse you then. See if he won't turn his back on you then. Yeah, he's lost all his stuff, but you have not touched him personally. Go ahead, challenge him physically. Put the thought of death in front of his eyes and see if he won't curse you to, curse you to your face. Satan has a really good point here. When people lose the things that bring them joy and then they start losing their grip on their own life, they will usually give anything to redeem that. You know those foxhole prayers? God, if you just please spare me, I'll do anything for you. People really do want to live. Go ahead and threaten him with his own life and see. See if he won't curse you then. What intrigues me most about Job was this, that this statement wasn't true about him. He remained faithful even when God allowed that to happen. The question is how? As I was reading through this book to find out what his secret was, I found so much wisdom and I wanna share that with you today because all of us have suffered, all of us go through rough times. What is the secret? What was his secret to go through all of this? There are several quotes throughout this book that are extremely helpful. This next verse is the one, uh, one of the most well-known quotes of Job but it still begs the question of how. But look, look at this next verse, Job chapter 13 and verse 14. It says, why do I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in my hands? Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Satan's comment about what a person would give up for their own life is quickly refuted by Job's comment here. Even if he takes my life, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. He's still trusting God. Job is asking why he should put his life in his own hands when God seems to have it all under control. Why would I consider my own life? Why am I worried about my own life? God's got this under control. I just trust him. I, I trust him. You typically don't trust a person who wants to take your life. I hopefully, hopefully that's true for all of you. If these are your friends, switch. You don't trust people who want to take your life. But Job insists that he will trust God even if God becomes one of those people. Even if God becomes the person who wants to take my life, I will trust him. It almost sounds foolish. If someone tells you, I want you to trust me, I'm going to kill you, but trust me, don't trust them. Don't do that. Don't trust that individual. I, you know, I don't care how close our friendship becomes. If you tell me you're going to take my life, there's a hole in our friendship. I'm sending you off for therapy. This is not healthy. Thing. That's not a good relationship. So Job wasn't just some dedicated soldier that was following the commands of his commander. That's not what this is. He spoke to God as a friend. He spoke to God like he was his friend. So this statement had to go a lot deeper than just dedication. There has to be something, even if he kills me, I'll trust him. How are you going to trust him if he does that? I mean, you have nothing left to do after he takes your life. I would even trust him if he says, I'm going to take your life. I'd still trust him then. This isn't just dedication. There's got to be something more to this. 
he also knew that life is going to present us with struggles. Job understood this. Look at Job 14 and verse 1. It says, man who is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. Job knew that life is not long and it can be tough. This statement is about life, not about God. That's a good thing to understand. This statement is about life. It's not about God. Job was able to separate the struggles from life in life from the person of God. He was able to separate those two things. What do we do when life gets really bad? A lot of times we blame God. Job says, no, those are two different things. Life can be tough. Our days are short and life is full of struggles. That's life. That's not God. Those are two different things. When tough times came, he did not blame God. He did not charge God with wrong. This is life. Sometimes bad things happen in life. Sometimes people do evil. Sometimes natural disasters and catastrophes. Sometimes that happens. This is all part of the existence we settled for when we chose to usher sin into the world. That's exactly, we made this. Bad things happen. Job said, that's life. It is a life we chose for ourselves. We created the chaos. God did not create the chaos. He's creating restoration. We've got to separate these two things. Life can be hard. Life can be tough. Life can be unfair. God, on the other hand, he's good. He's good. Even during a rough life, God is good. You've got to keep those things separated. When things happen, Job never charged God with wrong. That's a huge statement in the book of Job. He never charged God with wrong. Job had figured out the secret to living a joy-filled life even in the darkest times. Where did he get his wisdom? Where did he get his understanding? And th this is a fun fact. The price is the same. I'm giving this to you for free. And why that's such a good question is because of the age of the book of Job. The book of Job is the old book of the Bible. A lot of people don't know that. The book of Job is the oldest book of the Bible. Genesis tells us about the creation of the world, but it was written by Moses who wouldn't come in onto the scene for thousands of years later. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, but he wrote it thousands of years after the event took place. Job, the book of Job, actually dates back older than the book of Genesis. That means that Job was before the law. He was before Israel was a nation. There's a lot going on here. So where did he get his wisdom and understanding? That's a good question. Where did he get his wisdom and understanding? Job chose to follow the same message that Adam and Eve had passed down. Remember, they walked and talked with God. They spread this message. They sent this message down through the generations. And Job is one of these people that listened to that message. He chose to learn and grow in a relationship with God before they even had any books of the Bible in existence. If Job is the oldest book of the Bible, where were the books he read from? He, there were no books of the Bible in existence. So this really is a good question. Job, where did you get your wisdom and understanding? Where did you get this? There's only one way he could have had the level of wisdom that he had. He had to have been obsessed with God. He had to have been obsessed with the person of God. He wanted to know who God was. He wanted to know what God said. Somewhere before the book of Job was written, which again is the oldest, God had given mankind a message. Job records what that message was in the book of Job. I hope I'm not the only one that finds this awesome. Before the book of Job was written, God gave a message to mankind. And Job records what that message was. 
In this next verse, we have the inspired word of God telling us about what God said before he has ever inspired anyone to write it. That's really cool to me. Let me say that again. In this next verse, we have the inspired word of God because God inspired them to write this in the book of Job. We have the inspired word of God telling us about what God said before he ever inspired anyone to write it. Job chapter 28 in verse 28. It says, and to man, he said, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. God said this to mankind. The fear of the Lord is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. So what did Job do? Look at the very first verse of the book of Job one more time. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. The very first verse in the book of Job said, Hey, God gave a message to mankind, and I listened. I listened. What does it mean that he feared God? Fear is believing. This is fear in its most basic definition. Fear is believing that something is bigger than you, and it's outside of your control. It captivates your attention. That is all fear is. That's all fear is. To fear the Lord and to fear a storm are the same kinds of fear. You can be afraid of a storm because that thing is bigger than you and it's outside of your control and it's got your attention. <laughs> that is fear. Job feared the Lord. Job understood that his creator was much bigger than he was and he has complete control. He feared God. He has my attention. He is awesome. He's overwhelming. He's so big. He's so mighty. And he's in complete control. He's got control where I don't have control. I fear him. I am in awe of him. He also knew that God can do no wrong, so he shunned those things that were wrong. That is, the, he heard the message. God said, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. God said that to mankind. Job wrote it down. Here we are. This, this is what God said, so I'm going to listen to them, listen to God. And then it says, Job was a man who feared God and shunned evil because he heard the message and he applied it. The fear of the Lord is wisdom. Departing from evil is understanding. This wasn't something Job did. It was something he became. It was something he was. It was it's who he was. He was obsessed with God and he wanted to know the character of God. He knew that there were things that he did not understand, including the death of his 10 children. Yeah, there are some things I don't understand, God. But he never charged God with wrong. Never once did he charge God with wrong. He understood that God wasn't capable of doing wrong. God can't do wrong. Mark it down, memorize it, put it on your refrigerator, put it on your forehead so when you see it in the mirror, write it backwards so you can read it in the mirror. God can do no wrong. He can't do anything wrong. That's why he was able to say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. He knew that if God took his life, it was because it was the right thing to do. I don't have to understand it, but if he does it, it's because it was right. I don't have to understand it. I can have so many questions, but it, does, it doesn't matter if he's the one that did it. If he let this happen, it's okay. Because God can do no wrong. He can do no wrong. So what was Job's secret? How did he stay faithful? He learned who God was. A few weeks ago, I'm going to put somebody on the spot, but I'm not going to put them on the spot at all because I'm not going to tell you who they were. How about that? They'll know who they are. You'll know who you are. And I'm about to talk about one of you in this service today. You're here. You know you're here. You just don't know who I'm talking about yet. But I'm about to talk about somebody here, but I'm not going to reveal their name. A few weeks ago, someone told me to pour a bottle of liquid into my gas tank. It would help clean everything out and increase my gas mileage. 
I said, oh yeah, just go ahead and buy this, pour it in your gas tank. It'll increase your gas mileage, it'll clean your engine out, everything will be fine. I had never even heard of this product before. Never. They said, this is the name of the product, and I went, huh? That's my, that's, that is the level of expertise I have on this topic. Huh, that's all I had. He said, go ahead. This is, this is a good product. Put it in your gas tank. It'll, it'll increase your gas mileage and it'll, um, it'll clean the whole system out. The last thing you want to do in these times is affect your gas mileage in a negative way. You don't want to do it. It's $100 a gallon out there. You don't want, you don't want to take any of that gas mileage away. But he said, no, go ahead. Take this bottle of liquid that you've never heard of before. Pour it in your gas tank. It'll be fine. I told my wife that what this individual told me to do, and I was curious about the product. I'm curious about it. Now, I hadn't had a chance to do research on it yet, <clears throat> but about a week later, I told Amy, my wife, that I wanted to check this out. I want to check it out. And she said, oh, I already bought it and put it in. <laughs> I'm like, <gasps> <laughs> You did, huh? Yeah, I already, bought, I already bought it and put it in. It's, it's been in our gas tank for a while now. Why would she do something like this? <laughs> the bigger question is, why didn't I have a problem with it? She said, oh yeah. Okay, cool. That was the end of the conversation. Like, all right, it's done. Don't have to worry about that anymore. Why would she do this? And why would I have no problem with it? It was because we knew the character of the man who told us about it. That made all the difference for us. We weren't placing our trust in the outcome of the product. We were placing our trust in the person who told us that the outcome would be okay. That's why it went into my gas tank and I still don't know what it is. <laughs> I still don't know what's in there. It's working great. I don't know what it, I don't know what it is. Like, okay, cool. It worked. Job was so into who God was that the events of life did not change how much he loved him. I don't have to worry about the outcome of the product. I trust the one who said it's going to be okay if I trust him. That's all. Yeah, but what about your kids? I don't know why they had to go. I don't know why I had to lose them. But you're still going to trust him? Even if he says he's going to take my life, I will still trust him. Because it's the character of person that God is. I can thoroughly trust him. It's okay. But you didn't do your research. I did my research in one area. He is good. He is kind. He is loving. He can do no wrong. He is completely righteous. He is holy. His track record is perfect. And he said he is a God who will never change. So I'll go ahead and pour whatever it is into my gas tank. Because the character of the person that said it would be okay is all the research I need. I trust him. I completely trust him. I learned quickly that it wasn't what Job did. It was who he was. It was who he was. He yielded to God, understanding that God can do no wrong. God can do no wrong. I don't have to understand it. I don't need all the answers. I got one answer and I'm good with that. He is good and he can do no wrong. But what if life is bad? Even Job said, life is full of trouble. But that's life, that's not God. Separate the two. Go ahead, separate the two. Why blame God when life gets bad? Life is bad because of what we ushered into it, not because of what he brought into it. So yeah, life's gonna be hard sometimes. We're gonna lose people, we're gonna lose things. We're going to lose finances. We're going to have struggles. That's life. Isn't it great to know that we've got a God that says, hey, I'll do it with you. I'll go ahead and do it with you. I'm not promising to take all of the hardships away. 
I'm promising to walk through with you, through every hardship with you. I'll go through it with you. Trust him. Trust him. Job yielded to God, understanding that God can do no wrong. And by looking at Job's life, I began to understand God so much better. By reading Job's story, I began to understand the character of God so much better. You can have a relationship with Christians. You can be in every church service we have. You can memorize the Bible so well that you can quote it backwards. But if you do not have a growing relationship with the person of Jesus Christ, you are still missing it. You're still missing it. Jesus handed us the answer to a burden-filled life. Look at Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. It says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. <clears throat> the world is not spending their time thumbing through the Bible to figure out who God is. Just want to lay that on you right now. You don't, we don't have a world full of people who's searching the Bible to figure out who God is right now. They're not sitting there with their Bibles open. A lot of them don't even have Bibles. So that's not what they're spending their time doing. Many of them will never get to know him until they see him through the lives of his people. That's how they will get to know who God is. Let me illustrate this with one of the greatest compliments a child of God could ever receive. Put your name in this slot here. I'm going to call out on a couple of you, but put your name here. Wouldn't it be the greatest compliment you ever received if someone said, oh, if you don't know the Lord, then you've got to meet Josh and Tammy. Oh, if you don't know God, meet Josh and Claire. Have you met Shanna? If you don't know God, you've got to meet these people. That would be an incredible... If you don't know Him, then you need to meet them. Because they show his character, they are all about him. If you want to get to know him, then you're going to have to meet them. That's a huge compliment. Every one of us would want that said about us. It's not what we do. It's who we are. It's got to be who we are. And it isn't something that you can do by yourself. So don't take the torch and run with it here. It's not something you can do by yourself. We are to do this as a community. God put us together as his church. He wants us to do this as a community. People need to see the love of Jesus being exchanged. They need to see that happening. Even Jesus says they will know you that you are my disciples by the love you have for one another. People need to see the love of God being exchanged. The pictures that you've seen on the screen this morning are the pictures of the Dead Sea. You might have been looking at that going, what does that have to do with anything? But the pictures that have been popping up on the screen are pictures of the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is called the Dead Sea because rivers flow into the Dead Sea, but nothing ever flows out of the Dead Sea. So what happens is there's evaporation going on but all the salt and the elements and everything that flow into it, they don't evaporate and they're not flowing out anywhere. So there's no life in this body of water. It's the Dead Sea. We cannot be people who constantly take the love of God in and never let it get out. Because we've met those Christians, maybe we are those Christians. We've soaked up all the love of God and we are loving it. But does anybody know that if they want to get to know that, him, then they should get to know you? Anybody got that going on? Because that's a good compliment. That's a really good compliment to have. That person, there's love flowing in, there's love flowing out. That person's alive. 
You can see the life of God flowing from their life. That's not just somebody sitting there being stagnant. That is a person that is completely obsessed with who he is. So if you want to get to know him, you really need to get to know them. I want that said about my life. And I hope you want that said about your life. People need to see God's love showing out of the person that you are. And they also need to see you trusting in the person that he is. Because he can do no wrong. Lock that one in. You don't have to have the answers to all the problems. Why did this person have to die? Why did my finances happen? Why did I have to get robbed? Why did this happen? Why did that happen? You don't have to know the answers. No. Fine. God can do all the wrong. Even if he I can still trust him. Because he can do no wrong. The secret. What's the secret? The secret is relationship in action and on display. That is the secret. A life of suffering, no matter what you're going through, what's the secret? The secret a relationship in action and on display. I trust you. It's getting rough down there. Yeah, I feel it. Are you okay? Yeah, are you okay? <laughs> or we're in this together still, right? Yeah, then I trust you. What if you die? E even if you choose to take my life, I still trust you because you can't do anything wrong. Because if you take my life, that can be used in some way to reach people for Christ. Let's do that. Whatever is right, let's do that. Even if it gets really, really bad down here, it's going to be okay. Why? Because I trust him. I trust him. People need to see that you trust him. And people need to see that he loves them through you. The, the secret is a relationship in action and on display. Job learned who God was and rested on his character in every single situation that came his way. He trusted his friend. He trusted his friend. Do you call God that, or is he just God? Because he wants to be your friend. A good, good friend. I trust my friend. Yeah, but what if he, he can't? He can do no wrong. He's a good friend. I trust my friend. Job respected him and turned his back on anything that hindered his relationship with God. If it's evil, I don't want anything to do with it. Why? Because it'll get in the way of this. I trust him. I trust him. The secret to a life that is full of suffering and a soul, so full of burdens is a relationship in action and on display. Yeah, he's my friend. Can you trust him? Absolutely. What if he does something wrong? That must be your friend. That's not my friend. My friend can do no wrong. I trust him. I trust him. What if somebody does you wrong? I need to figure out how he would handle this situation and do it like that because he's really good at what he does. <laughs> so I want to reflect that because I trust him. I trust him. That's the secret. I don't know what you're going through in life right now. I don't know the struggles you're dealing with. I know some of the struggles some of you are dealing with because like I said at the beginning of the sermon, a lot of people do bring their burdens to me and I get to carry them with you. And I do love that. I absolutely love that. But I'll, I'm telling you, you don't even have to come see me. I'm going to give you the answer. If you're struggling, you can trust him. You can trust him. Go ahead. Trust him. It's going to be okay. Take that big old bottle of whatever it is and pour it into your gas tank. Go ahead. I don't know the answers. Who told you it was going to be okay? Yeah, he said it was going to be okay. Why aren't you pouring already? Why aren't you already pouring it? Trust him. A relationship in action and on display. Shine the light in our community. Shine the light.